Bibles, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 2. I began this series some weeks ago. It's called The River of God. And I started at the end. I began at Revelation 22, and then I went to John chapter 7. Last week I was in Ezekiel chapter 47. And this week I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 2. I've gone to the very beginning as we see this river unfolding. And this river has concurrently, consistently existed since the beginning of the creation of the earth. And it will be consummated and fulfilled and continue in the new Jerusalem, in the new city of God, and as the re-inhabited planet Earth. And so we talked about that in Revelation 22. So pick it up, if you would, please, in the book of Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse number 10 down to verse number 14. And it says this, Genesis 2, verse number 10, A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. Note that, headwaters. Some of your versions may say four rivers, but it actually says headwaters. And that's the actual rendering of the Hebrew. And the name of the first was the Pishon, and it winds through the entire land of Habila, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, aromatic, resin, and onyx are there also. Three things, three kinds of things. First of all, there's lots of gold. Secondly, there's an aromatic resin, which is good for the smell. It's sweet smelling, like a perfume or a cologne. And then we also have the fact that there was onyx that was there, okay? A gem, gemstones. Going on in the text, it says this, And the name of the second river is the Gihon, and it winds through the entire land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the river Tigris, and it runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. So we're going to teach on this subject this morning, and I want to preface it by looking at verse number 10, and it says again, and this is my introductory statement, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and from there it was separated into four headwaters. A river, one river, flows out of Eden, no, this flows out of Eden, not into Eden, but out of Eden, and then it begins to start four different headwaters, and then ultimately four rivers come out of it, Okay. My wife's father for many years was a farmer, and as a, as a young boy, he moved from North Dakota to Montana, to Hardin, Montana, which is on the Bighorn River. Anybody ever heard the Battle of the Little Bighorn? Yep. Custer's Battlefield, not far from there. Been there many times. We were just there in Wyoming about a month ago. We were back hunting with my family. We drove right by where Custer's last stand. Now they call it the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Because we, they didn't want to continue to honor Custer in that way. It was a big <laughs> faux pas for him. Yeah. But needless to say, the Bighorn River flows through there as well as the Little Bighorn River flows through there. Now, the reason I bring it up is because Elmer was a farmer. His brother, whose name was Henry, and then Henry's two sons, which was Leroy and Marvin, they farmed with their dad. Their dad died. And when their dad died, my father-in-law went to help out because the boys were too young to assume the farm. So he then helped them farm, and their farm was on the banks of the Bighorn River, as well as highland dry farming. The reason I bring it up is because the Bighorn, like many other farmers in that area, they irrigate off of it. They irrigate wheat, they irrigate corn, they irrigate other crops, barley that is there, and they irrigate it. In fact, they dig these big trenches, they have waterways that they go in with their tractors, they dig it out, the water begins to flow, and it's lush, beautiful bottom land. And as you look throughout that country, when you're coming from Billings, Montana to Hardin, it's 40 miles basically of high desert is what it is. If you guys have ever been to Bend, Oregon, and you go east from there, we consider that high desert. That's a lot like what it is from Billings to Hardin, 40 miles of high desert. And then you come into that valley where the Bighorn is, and it runs, and you begin to look, and as you go from there all the way up to the dam, which is Yellowtail Dam, it's about 40 miles. By the way, it's famous for fishing today. Fishing guides from all over the world bring, cl bring clients in there, and they catch giant rainbows and giant brown trout. And so they fish it in the summertime. But anyway, needless to say, the farmers, they irrigate it off of it. So on both sides, it's green, it's verdant, it's beautiful, it's lush. So I want you to picture in that mind as we teach today about this river of God that flows out of Eden and then it has four headwaters that begin four rivers from it. It gives us a concept of understanding and you need to understand something else that this was before there was any rain on planet earth. If you study the Bible, anybody who's student in the Bible, you'll know that before the flood there was no rain. In fact, it says that there was a mist 
that took place and that also up from the ground there were springs that fed and watered the ground up to that point in time. If you also study anything in archaeology, you also know that up to that point in time, most of the earth was a veritable garden, biosphere. Yeah. And that plants were large, animals were large, they had much oxygen, everything grew large and beautiful, and it was lush. But a cataclysmic event took place worldwide. Yeah. It was called the Flood. We call it Noah's Flood. You ever read about that in yeah. the book of oh, yeah. Genesis chapter 6 through verse chapter 9? The whole flood story. And so you have to remember that when the writer writes, he's describing a river and four rivers that were pre-existent before the flood. When the flood came, it messed everything up. Yep. It changed things. The Bible says that the great deeps burst open and probably hot magma and lava flowed up and water took place and it rained for the first time. Those two things meet. You have a major, major power clash and encounter. And it changed everything. Now, where I grew up in South Dakota, if you go 40 miles straight out to the, what I would call east of us towards the desert, it's called the Badlands. Now, the Badlands is full of fossilization and dinosaur bones everywhere. Now, if you go to South Dakota right now, it's cold there. And I thank God that I live in Oregon and I don't live in South Dakota anymore. I was born and raised there. I grew up with snow. I grew up with it being snowing from basically November to March. Snow on the ground, snow on the roads. And you just learn to deal with it. You wear over boots. I mean, you wear clothes and you wear un thermal underwear and all of that. It's just like part of growing up there. And I thank God I don't live there anymore. If I want snow, I'll go to snow. My wife was the same way. She was born and raised in Spokane, Washington. Snowed there, cold there. If you watch the duck game, did anybody watch the duck game yesterday? Yes. Yes. It's by yes. Pullman. Yes. Pullman's, yeah. Pullman's not far from Spokane. It's on the border of Idaho and Washington, eastern yeah. Washington. And there was snow piled up. Did you see that? Yes. I said, I told my wife, I said, I thank God that we don't have to live in that and shovel that and get ready for that anymore. So what happened between that time and now was called the flood that killed off those dinosaurs because at that time in South Dakota, we're now about December, it's going to be freezing, it's going to be cold. But then it was a tropical place with all kinds of lush dinosaurs and lush ground and all of that. Something took place. Now, I said all that to bring to your attention that this was probably not the same after the flood as it was before the flood. So in our minds, we think of the Fertile Crescent, which is the beginning of Western civilization, which is basically Syria, modern-day Iran, the Crescent, that all of humanity started there. Israel is a part of that. And we recognize all of that. But at this time, it's dry desert climate. Then it wasn't. It says that the Lord planted a garden in Eden. A garden in Eden. Sometimes we think of Eden as the garden. Garden. Eden means paradise. It means delight. But it was a garden planted in Eden, which is in the east. When we think of the east now, we don't think of nice, beautiful garden. We think of dry desert, Iran, Iraq, and all of that. It's dry. It's nasty. And so as a result of that, this watering took place, and it flowed from there, and it separated into these four headwaters. This is what we're talking about today. Now, again, in my introductory statement, much speculation has emerged with regard to the identification of these rivers. It is entirely possible that these four rivers are no longer in existence and that the topography of the entire earth was transformed by the flood. Okay, case in point. Again, in Wyoming, we went out of Dayton to Ranchester, Ranchester up into the Bighorn Mountains. As you climb, you're climbing from about 3,000 foot elevation to 9,000 foot elevation. As you wind up this road, you'll have signs by the side of the road. It'll say you're in the Paleostoan era, you're in the uh, Bighorn era, you're in this era, and it marks off the different stratas that are in the rock formations as you go up. And it's amazing how even archaeologists recognize throughout the world that somewhere this flood took place where there's this giant upheaval of a turning over on itself. My point is this. So if you're thinking in terms of the present-day Tigris and Euphrates River, you need to disregard it because it probably isn't what it was. 
I believe the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? Yeah. Because if you go to Israel today and you look for where the Tigris Euphrates are, you can't find the other two rivers. You can't find the Pishon and the Gihon. They're not there. Although there are rivers that they think maybe it's the Nile. Maybe there's another river called the Prat, which is also uh, another river that's there. The Hadekel, which is uh, all these rivers that they're probably there. One is underground. It doesn't really matter. Okay? I I'm just going to say it. it doesn't matter because I believe the word. Yeah. Because in the beginning, it was there. Yeah. It may not be there now, but it was there then. Yeah. Now, why do you say that? Because everything that there is in the natural, there is something in the spiritual that is a parallel to that, if you will. Yeah. And what we see happening here is that this river that is in the garden typifies, if you will, the tabernacle and the outflow of the river as seen in Ezekiel 47, as what Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 7, verses 38 and 39, that out of your innermost being, rivers of living water will flow. This spake he about the spirit that had not yet been given, but how do you know the spirit has been given? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. It's been given. Read Acts chapter 2. How about Acts chapter 1? Jesus said, just before he got ready to leave, he says this. He says, you shall receive power. He says, about the times and dates, it doesn't really matter. He says, but what will happen is, he says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you with power. And you'll be my, what everybody? Witnesses. Witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. You're going to go throughout the world. So, Jerry, when your movie goes out, it's part of that story. The gospel story that's going to the nations. We would have never thought at that particular time of the mediums that are available to us today. Of film, of the internet, and of movie theaters that are available today worldwide. Where you can sit down, or you can even now sit in your own home and watch a DVD. Or even something that's online. And it can go there through out the world. That's why in foreign countries in particular, in Muslim countries, the gospel is penetrating those areas because where you and I couldn't go before as Christians because we'd be killed, right. Wayne, yes. for our faith yeah. in Jesus, True. we can yeah. go via yeah. digital situation. We can go with, via a digital platform or format. And yeah. there a message is presented. The Jesus film goes everywhere. And people watch it and they get born again. Now we would consider an okay piece of cinematography, Jerry. But you know what? It doesn't matter. The message. I'm not talking about your movie. I'm talking about the Jesus movie now. Okay. But what ends up happening is it's presented throughout the world. They just show the movie. And they give an altar call. And people get born again. Hallelujah. It's amazing. That's why Helen and I go to the nations. We travel to the far-flung corners of the world, representing Word and Spirit International Church, representing John and Taurus Ministries, but more importantly, representing Jesus Christ, who called us and anointed us to go to the world. And then when we give the altar call, the people get up in mass, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in China, whether it's in India, whether it's in Africa, whatever country in Africa, whether it's down in South or Central America, whether it's in Mexico, and people come and they get born again to the glory of God. Come on, somebody, say amen. Why? Because Acts 1a is a reality. Because the Holy Spirit has come, and out of our innermost being is flowing rivers of living water. We're not just up there spouting words, but we're preaching the living and compromised word of the living God. Hallelujah. And the reality of it took place in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one accord or in one place. Everybody say unity. unity. We need to get America into unity. Wouldn't it be nice if that were the case? We're totally divided down the middle. I don't know that we'll ever be back together again until Jesus comes. It will take a miracle. And that's what it's going to take to bring America back to, to our founding and to what we believe and what we're established upon as Americans. I'm American through and through. I'm a flag waver through and through. I'm a patriotic God. Yeah. That when the Star Spangled Banner plays, I'm up on my feet. It yeah. brings tears to my eyes when I'm at the opening Dodgers game. And I'm seeing them usually play the San Francisco Giants down in L.A. And the F-15s go buzzing by. And they release the birds and the Star Spangled Banner. It brings tears to my eyes. Why? Because I thank God for America. I thank God I was born in the greatest nation of the world. And it'll stay that way, hopefully, if we can see it come back to its moorings and its founding. Yeah. 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 Woo! <laughs> now we see the reality of what's yet future out of Revelation 22. Yeah. Yeah. Not yet happened yet, but he says, you know what, after everything has been destroyed, and the new heaven, and the new earth, and the new Jerusalem, there is a river that will flow out of the tabernacle, out of the temple. It'll start there, and you talked about it a moment ago, because as in the natural, so in the spiritual. That a reality of what you showed us out of that river 
that it begins to flow. And every 200 yards, it becomes something bigger and grander and larger. And it refreshes and it brings life wherever it goes. The ultimate reality is its wholeness. It's healing. It's a restoration of that which sin and Satan has corrupted. We live in a fallen world. That's the reality. In a fallen world, there's a law called the second law of thermodynamics. It's the law of entropy. Things don't get better. They get worse. Okay? That is the reality, unless the supernatural intervention of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the earth, as we know, it's wasting away. It can only be restored. And I don't care how many environmentals you have marching around with flags. It ain't going to change it until Jesus comes. Amen. Now, I'm not saying destroy the earth. We need to be conservation-minded. But we don't worship a tree. We don't worship a rock. Okay? We don't venerate that. We are venerating the Lord and Savior, the Creator, who gave us those things to enjoy and to use. Rightfully and respectfully. Okay? Uh, you, you ought to know I'm a hunter. I'm a fisherman. I love the woods. I love the outdoors. I'm for taking care of it. But I'm not for, for this radical environmentalist stuff. So we have four rivers. Everybody say four rivers. Four rivers. Now remember, it's headwaters. Mm -hmm. Headwaters. Okay? Which could imply a large body of waters. That's why some would speculate it could be the Persian Gulf. It could be the Red Sea. It could be the Nile River. And it could also be the Tigris Euphrates Valley, if you were to put it in today's perspective. If we were to think that way, it would make sense. But it's one river that flows, and it's touching all the others. Now, how does that relate to us today? Let's look at point number one the Pishon River. The word Pishon means the full flowing, the full flowing river. And I'm looking here at verse. Uh, number 11 and 12, the full flowing. It's the name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. By the way, it's interesting to me, the Euphrates, which we know the most about, he talks the least about. Like he mentions it last. Oh, and by the way, the Euphrates. But the Pishon, which we know nothing about, he says this river is an awesome river. And in fact, its name means full flowing. That means big, inverted, boom, moving. And what ends up happening, he says there's, there's gold there, there's aromatic resin there, and there's onyx stones there as well. Now, isn't that cool what ends up happening? That around this river, there is gold. Amen. There's gold. How do you know God's not against you having prosperity? You. God's not against you being blessed. Nor am I. So if he's for it, I'm for it. How many of you know I'm for whatever God's for? Amen. And I believe that sometimes, I believe that people are in a position where they are because they have made mistakes financially. They have not thought right correctly regarding God's word. They think it's God's, God gets glory out of them being poor just like they think it's God's book. God gets glory out of them being sick. And neither is true. That's right. I don't believe God's getting any glory out of being poor. you being poor. I think it's his desire for you to be blessed. Yes. Okay? Yes. I believe it's his desire for you to be well. Yes. So you've got to contend for that. Everybody say contend. Yes. You know what contend means? And I do. Fight. Fight it means for to fight for it. Right. You've got to fight for it. Did not the nation of Israel before they went into the promised land, did they not have to fight for the promised land? Yes, yes they did. Yes. They had to march in. They had to do what the Lord said. They had to fought, fight, but the Lord gave them the victory because he'd already promised them the land. Yeah. So sometimes in your health, sometimes in your wealth, you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to contend for the promises of God and appropriate the purpose of God and appropriate the word of God yes. in order for you to be blessed, prosperous, healthy, and whatever. Okay? So if you don't believe that, well, that's okay. You don't have to. It doesn't mean you're not going to go to heaven. You just aren't going to have that. That's a good place to say amen. 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 A good place to say that's the truth. Yeah. So the Pishon. Go with me to the book of Haggai, chapter 2, if you would, please. It's an Old Testament book as well. The prophet Haggai prophesies, and here's what he says concerning a coming time, a future yet time. It says in verse number 1 of Haggai, chapter 2, And the second year of King Darius, on the, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. By the way, this is after the Babylonian captivity. Yep. Seventy years they're in captivity. Why? Because of their backslidden condition. Mm -hmm. How do you know America's backslidden right now? Oh, yeah. How do you know some of the churches backslidden right now? Yeah. Yeah. They need to turn their hearts back to God. They need to get right with the Lord. That's right. And when they do, there is a promise of restoration. That's always the heart of God. He says in verse number, uh, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. Verse 2, speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the, ten, the remnant of the people asked them, who of you is left who saw the house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? 
But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat. The high priest, be strong, all you people from the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted when I was with you. And when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you, do not fear. Let me ask you this. If the spirit was there then, is the spirit not here today? Yeah. How much more so is the spirit here today than then? Then it came upon them. Now it's innocent flowing out of us. Yes. He says, be strong, Harvey. Be strong, Marilyn. Be strong, Joseph. Be strong, Holly. Be strong, Wayne. Come on, somebody. Be strong, Helen. He's telling us, be strong. It's the word of the Lord to us. Here's what he says then, verse number 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, plural, and what is desired by all nations will come. Everybody say, Jesus. Jesus. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Almighty. How many know it all belongs to him? Yeah. He's not afraid of silver and gold. And the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Almighty. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Peace yeah. is on the way. Hallelujah. God's blessing is on the way. And guess what? God has all the gold and all the silver that He needs. Yeah. He just needs to get it to us because we need to get it to help advance the kingdom yeah. of God. Yeah. The Kishon River is still flowing. The Gihon River. The word here means to break forth. It means to burst out. And the name of the second river is the Gihon, and it winds through the entire land of Cush. Now, we know modern-day Cush is actually Ethiopia, which is in northern Africa. Did you know that? If you look at a map, and you look at a map, modern-day Cush is actually Ethiopia of the present. It used to be Cush, now called Ethiopia. Now, the only river that I know that's over there that is near there is the Nile River. Okay? It's the only river. On the other side is the Persian, or is the Red Sea. It's the only place that's there. Now, I'm not saying that's the headwater. Possibly. Maybe. It really doesn't matter. Okay? Go with me to the book, if you would, please, of 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. David is the king. We talked about David a moment ago. Thank you for that treatise, Harvey. 2 Samuel chapter 5. And jump down, if you would, please, to the verse number 17. David's having an encounter with the Philistines. Isn't it interesting how as we look at the Old Testament, how many times they were in battle? Yeah. Have you know we're still in battle? Yeah. 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 Your battle. Isn't that what the Bible says? Nothing new under the sun, right? right. Ephesians 6 12. But your battle is not against what? Flesh and blood. The literal rendering is we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The word wrestle is the Greek word gumnazo. It comes from the Grecian games where they would literally wrestle and box and fight to the death. The whole gladiator thing came out of that situation. But the battlemen, the word gumnazo means to wrestle to the death, if you will. How do you know I already have life? Mm -hmm. I ain't given up my life. I already have life. My life is found in Jesus Christ. I was born again, yeah. and the moment I came born again, I got life. Yeah. So it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against wickedness, and rulers in what? High places. That is a hierarchical archon, if you will, is the Greek word. An archon, a hierarchy of angelic beings that are fallen. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So I'm not wrestling against Wayne. Wayne's not wrestling against me. Donaldo, I'm not wrestling against you. You're not wrestling against me because I beat you up anyway. Anyway. But my daddy told me he never hit a girl. How many of you had that one, right? Yeah. I'm just, I'm goofing around now. Some weirdo will come and say, right, what are you talking about? Anyway, so <laughs> we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Not our fellow human beings, Gene. But against the principalities and powers and rulerness and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's who our warfare is against. So what ends up happening, those very same rulers come to manipulate those who are against God, the kingdom of God, and the church. And they will be used as manipulative pawns and tools as if on a chess board to come against us to wage war against us. To buffet against us. And how many you know it's incumbent upon us to stand? Having done all to stand, stand. stand. With the belt of truth around your waist. Stand. The breastplate of righteousness upon your chest. The gospel of shoes upon your feet. Yes. With the sword of the spirit in your left hand. Or in your right hand. With the shield of faith in your left hand. The helmet of salvation upon your head. And with the lance of the spirit in your mouth. How many you know you got to come into warfare by speaking some things? Yeah, right. The offensive weapons are the sword and the spear. We speak out of our mouth. 
And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. testimony. They love not their lives unto the death. Revelation 12, 11. That's why your words are so important. Amen. Don't agree with the enemy. Agree no. with what God's yes. word says. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Then if we would say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, do not doubt in our heart, but believe we would say, we shall have it. According to Mark 11, 23, 22, 23, 24. In fact, 22 says, have the faith of God. Have the God kind of faith. That's what it means literally in the Greek. Thank you. Okay, let's don't dumb this thing down and make it easy on everybody. Let's rise up to the standard that we've been called to. Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen. So that we begin to decree and speak things out loud. And then we, can, we begin to agree with what God's word says. So this Gihon means to break forth. All right, so we have these Philistines. Verse 17. And when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired the Lord. It's a good thing to inquire the Lord. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he says, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? Don't pick fights that aren't yours to fight. Amen. That's right. oh, amen. <laughs> Don't be picking fights that aren't yours to fight. No. And the Lord answered him, go for I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hands. So David went to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. And he said, as waters break out, as waters break out. The word Gihon means to break out or to break forth. As the waters break out. If God be for us, who can be against us? The Bible says that the Lord is going to break out against him. Now going on in the text, it says this. As the waters uh, break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me, so that the place was called Baal Perazim. And the Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. Once more the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired the Lord, and he answered, Go straight, do not go straight up, but he, anyway, it's a whole other story. But it says that he broke out against them, and they defeated them. How many of the breakthrough is the Lord's? It's the Lord's. Let him fight our battle. Now we're participating in this. By what we say out of our mouth yes. and by agreeing with his word. Yeah. That's the Gihon. The third river is the Tigris. Now the word Tigris, going back over here to Genesis chapter 2. No, you better not because I'm going to get you back to Kings in five seconds. Let me go to Genesis and you stay in Kings. It says this, the Tigris, it means the darting or sharp arrow. The name of the third river is Tigris and it runs along the east side of Asher. So we have a sharp arrow. Now, I know something about sharp arrows because I archery hunt. I have a bow. I've had a number of bows. I've killed a number of game animals with my bow. I know what it can do. I'm amazed at how humanely and fast it will put down a game animal. Oh. I was with your son, and we called it a buck deer. And he showed me this spot. We went in there, and he was rattling for me. And I rattled this buck deer in, and, it was in, in, and I shot it at 55 yards with my bow, and, and it killed it. Boom. I have the horns in my garage. I just thought of that as I was standing here talking about archery hunting. Her son Mitch likes to hunt too. He's a hunting maniac. And so did Ron. And, uh, and so did Donna. What do I mean? Donna's like, Donna and Annie Oakley, she's just like Holly, man. She's deadly with the world. I mean, you got to watch out for these girls. They'll take you out in a heartbeat. Holly's sniper quality. I mean, Holly's already killed three game animals this year with her rifle, and three of them, two of them are over 400 yards. She's, she's amazing. I hate to admit this, but she shoots better than I do. Of course, it doesn't take much to do that. But, but that's honesty, right? The tigress, it means the darting or sharp, swift arrow. Do you know that in the Bible, it talks about that not to miss the mark? The word there is harmatia. Harmatia means to miss the mark. Mm -hmm. And when you're an archer, you want to hit the mark. You pick a spot. When you're looking at a game animal, you're not enamored by the whole entire animal. You're looking at one small spot. My dad and I were elk hunting on the coast. I'd been in eastern Oregon. We'd come back, and he and his buddy at that time, Dick McCall, they'd been hunting up in the Cascades. They hadn't seen an elk for an entire week. They hadn't seen a dry track for an hour. I said, why in the world did you stay there? I said, come with me. Let's go to the coast. We got on the coast. It was like, a, I don't remember if it was a weekday or what it is. In those days, I had a blazer. We drove over to the coast. It was like 45 minutes to where we were hunting, an hour at the most. We got to the spot, and I started bugling. 
I called in a bull. I says, all right, I'm going to go after it. So I bailed off down into the canyon. I bugled a bull all the way from across the other canyon. It's by using an elk bugle to call them in during the mating season. I called him all the way across. I could hear him coming up through the brush. I could see him coming up the brush. He walked clear up the side. I'm up on a dead stump right there. I'm all camoed up. I've got my bow. This elk literally walks from, from me to where Caroline is right there. You see Caroline? Wave your hand at me, Caroline. How many of you know that's close? Yes. Wouldn't you call that close? Yes. I could see his big five-point rack sticking up. The oh thing's standing and looking straight at me. And I'm going, this is a dead elk, baby. I have my arrow knocked. I'm waiting the whole way. I draw back. And when I release my arrow, I hit exactly what I aimed for. Because where I was looking is where I shot. I was looking at the horns. And that arrow went whoosh, right through those horns. That elk wheeled, that bull wheel turned and went, never saw him again. I should have killed him. But I shot at the wrong spot. I shot where I was looking at. What's the lesson to all of us? You're going to go where you're looking at. Yeah, Ask my friend Ken Gob, who called me the other night on the phone. How you doing? He called me. I think it was Friday night, like 9 o'clock. He calls me. I'm doing awesome. We had to have commiserate about the whole election deal. But anyway, I'm glad I have friends that run like I do, man. We're, anyway, we're chatting about that. And Ken says this statement. He goes, you know what? We will move towards our most dominant thought. What you think about, what you look at is where you're moving to. Ask my wife whenever I'm driving up the freeway, I'm going up I-5. If I'm looking at if I'm looking at deer, if I'm looking at a hawk on the road, pretty soon the car starts start, the car starts drifting. She goes, Where are you looking at? Get that thing back on the road. Quit looking at the animals. Good job, man. Yeah, good job. That is what happened. So the arrow goes and it's the darting arrow. It's swift and it's sharp in the same way. What are you focused on? in this season. That's why our thoughts yes. and our words, our yeah, attitudes are so important. Yes, yes for sure. True. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so it's not he. exclusive to man, it's talking about mankind. As a man or a woman thinketh in their heart, so, so is he. So are they, yeah. You become what you think. You become what you focus on. All right, did I tell you to go to 2 Kings 13? No. no. Well, let's go there, can I? I was so busy telling you a story, I forgot to tell you where to go. Second Kings 13. Second Kings chapter 13. Are you guys enjoying this series? Yes. Good. Yes. Praise God. Second Kings 13, beginning at verse 14. It's about Elisha. Remember him? Yes. He is the protege of Elijah. Yes. Remember, he's the guy that asked for the double portion anointing of Elijah. And Elijah says, if you want, if you see me go when I'm taken, then you'll get it. If not, I can't can't guarantee it. And he did. Yes. Stayed with him like super glue. Never left his side everywhere he went. I got to go to the bathroom. I'm going with you. No. <laughs> Even the prophets, the school of prophets said, hey, do you know your master is going to be taken from us? He goes, I know. I know. You all know the story. Well, this is Elisha. Now, he comes to the end of his life. Verse 14. Now, Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha said, get a bow. Prophetic thing. I love this. If somebody spoke to me about the about the prophetic statement of what's going to happen in the days ahead, I'd love this. Get a bow and some arrows, he said. And he did so. Take the bow to your hands. And he said to the king of Israel, when he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. <laughs> Transfer of anointing. You wonder why we lay hands on people? Yeah. There's an impartation. Yes. Old Testament, New Testament, yes. present Testament. Amen. Okay. In the present, we are in the New Testament. There's yes. something about the laying on of hands. It's a transfer of anointing. Yes. It's not just why I'm laying hands on somebody, I'm massaging their neck. <laughs> now, I know in old time Pentecost, we'd get, we'd get carried away and we'd be like, We'd be pushing on people's heads and we'd be rubbing their shoulders and praying through for the Holy Ghost or whatever. And I know sometimes we got a little aggressive or whatever, but it's better to be a little aggressive than no aggressive. Yeah, Might as well go yeah. after something than not yeah, go yeah, after something. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. Here's what Elisha said. He says, open the east window, he said, and he opened it. 
shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. And the Lord's era of victory, the era of victory over Aram. Elisha declared, you will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. I like this. Shoot that arrow, let it fly out that window, and as it goes in the same way, are you going to defeat your enemies? Just like the Tigris River was like the darting or the sharp swift arrow. It got to its target. He's saying in the same way, that river is still flowing. I mean, the Lord is still sharpened. He has a razor edge, and he can use you to accomplish what he needs to accomplish in this day and hour. It's not by accident that you are here in the greater Eugene Springfield area. It's not by happen chance that you're sitting in Word and Spirit International Church listening to my voice. It's not by happen chance that you've been born for such a time as this to rise up, to speak, to intercede, to prophesy, to declare, to decree, to decree, to speak the Word of God that wherever you go and God gives opportunity. Yesterday I had the opportunity to go to a fellow workmate's construction guy and to do a memorial service for his wife. And most of these guys, they don't know Jesus. Most of these guys and gals are pretty pagan, are pretty heathen. In fact, they had a bunch of them standing outside the tent while I'm inside preaching. They have their whiskey and their Coke and they're drinking while they're listening to me preach. And I tell you what, I just preached the gospel, the good news of Jesus. I had about a five-minute segment and I gave them the Lord Jesus Christ. I said out of John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house for many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you may go also. Then Thomas says, well, Lord, we don't know the way. He says, Thomas, you've been with me so long and you don't know the way. He says, no, Lord, show us the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Come on, somebody. That's what I preach. I said, there's three things I see. Number one, in times of trial, in times of loss, in times of tribulation, guess what? We can believe in God because he's always there to help us. I said, second thing is, is that Jesus was doing this on the night before he was betrayed, and he died. And it says he went to die to go prepare a place for us. And he's been there for 2,000 years. And it's got to be a pretty awesome place if he's been gone that long because he's coming back for me again. And then I said, number three. I said the number three. I'm preaching about this long. And it says the number three. I said the only access route to heaven is through Jesus Christ because he's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only Oh Woo! And then I pray. Yeah. I mean, it don't it take much to tell people about Jesus. Yeah. You go for what you got. That's why you got to have the Holy Spirit flowing out of you. Because when the opportunity arises, He'll stir up in you what you need to say. Come on, somebody. That seed does not fall on crusty de death soil. I believe that people heard the word of God. By the way, people come up to you afterwards. Embrace me and hug me, even with COVID. Everybody masked up and all of that. Probably have 50 to 70 people there that were gathered together in a tent out on this guy's property. That's what it does by building relationships and God giving you favor. And he introduced me as Father John. Here's Father John. That's my nickname on the construction group. I'm Father John. I'm either Padre or Father John. We all have nicknames. Everybody has a nickname. Yes, Father John. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. The Tigris River. And then finally there's the Euphrates River. Yeah. One last river. By the way, you know what Euphrates means? It means the sweet. You're the sweet one. You guys must not watch that commercial. I don't like it anyway. I don't like that one. It's a Dr. Pepper ad. It's the sweet one. Anyway, the sweet. It means the sweet. Signifying to be sweet and pleasant is what Euphrates means. I mean, every word means something. Yes. There's an etymology behind the name. It's rooted. Your name means something. Yes. You may not know what your name means, but it means something. You know what my name means? John, God's gracious gift. That's I'll right. take it. You are. Yeah, Increasing I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. Increasing <laughs> faith. There you are. So you're afraid. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 16. While you're turning there, it says, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. You know what? He just gives you the least amount about that river because it's something that we see all the time. But anyway, it says here, it says, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Go to Proverbs 16. I'm almost done. The more I preach, the stronger I get and the more I go. So, winding me up. Proverbs 16, yes. Proverbs 16, verse 22 through 24. Here's what it says. 16, 22 
twenty two through twenty four prudence is a fountain of life to the prudent the folly brings punishment to the fools twenty three the hearts of the wise make their mouths prudent and their lips promote instruction verse twenty four is the one i want to get to gracious words are a honeycomb sweet to the soul and healing to the bones thank you I don't know, Holly brought this over. I don't know how it ended up in our little tree basket, but there's this thing that is a packet and it has honey sticks. I don't know how it got there, but I bit into one the other day and I just sucked it down. Oh, yeah. I'm good. You ever had this honey? Oh, yeah. He says, your words are like that. They are sweet. Look at verse 24. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Our words have the power of life and death. Proverbs 18, 21. They're life-giving. They're life-producing. It's sweet. It's flowing out. So we see this fourth river, the Euphrates, is like that river that's bringing sweetness to the soul. And it satisfies healing in your bones and in your life. Amen. The Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates... And the main river is the river of God that's flowing. Amen. That starts each one of these headwaters that flow out. Let me read my conclusion and then I'll be done. Mm -hmm. it says, this very river may be an emblem of the everlasting love of God. That pure river of water of life which springs from the throne of God and of the Lamb. From the divine sovereignty and not from faith, love, and obedience of man. He's not saying it's not important. But it's just that this is like the river of love that flows. You don't earn it. How do you know you can't earn love? No. Love is no. freely given. Okay? With no expectation in return. Okay. Okay, that's what love is. True love. Agape. Agape from agapeo, which is the root word for the Greek word love. And you talked about phileo, which is Philadelphia love. Storge. Okay? And eros. Those are the four Greek words that are used for love. But agapeo or agape is the love that's selfless. It's giving without expecting anything in return. That's what we're talking about. That river, that streams, whereof make glad the city of God in which water the garden. How about the garden is the church? Yeah. Revive its plants. How many of you know we're the plants? And make it fruitful and delightful. How many of you know you want to be fruitful? You want to be delightful. Yeah. That's what happens when the river comes in you and out of you. Uh -huh. yeah. The four heads or branches of which are eternal election of God, particular redemption, by Christ, regeneration and sanctification by the Spirit, and eternal life and happiness as the free gift of God through Christ. Again, Psalms 46, 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. It flows in us. It flows out of us. That's what you and I are. We are the recipients of God's love. It is like His river flowing into us. And when we be used of Him, to extend that love to all those that we come in contact with. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. Yes. I pray that anyone that is watching today has heard my voice, Lord God, can resonate with the fact that your river is flowing in them and out of them. And the only way with certainty we know is that we have received Christ as our Savior and Lord, that we have accepted him. And that we have confessed with our mouth that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. That we believe in our heart God raised Him from the dead. On the basis of that fact, we are born again. So Lord, I pray for those that are watching that they've made that choice. If they haven't, let them just say, Jesus, come into my heart. I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. If they do that, and if you do that, you'll be born again. Yes. You'll be saved. Amen. You'll begin a new journey that the river of God flows in you and out of you. In His name we pray. Amen. 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 You can turn this off if you would, Joseph. I don't know how. Hit finish. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Oh, crap. Hit finish. I tried to. It won't. I'm hit done. Finish. Something messed up here. Sorry. I don't know what I did. <laughs>